So how and why did you start to study the endocannabinoid system and the cannabinoids? Okay, so I started working on it in um, the University of Dundee in Scotland and that was a lab studying pharmacology of receptors, orphan receptors, so not very well known, not very well defined what these receptors do. But what we knew was that these receptors dealt with lipid molecules, so fatty molecules. And what we realized is that actually cannabinoids uh, are fatty molecules and they were having a strong interaction with some of these receptors. So the one that I was particularly interested on was GPR55 that at the time was not particularly known as part of the endocannabinoid system, but it turned out that was a very big player, an important player, especially for, for example, some cancer pathways and migration pathways of cells. Fast forward, we started to think, what are the other components in the cannabis plant that are lipids but are not cannabinoids? And there is where terpenes come out. So this is, the, is your experience with terpenes, so can you tell a little bit more about it? Pretty much any product that we are using with a smell, and when we are in the kitchen, we usually tend to you want to use a lot of terpenes, mm -hmm. and that makes uh, our food tasty. So terpenes pretty much are uh, the, the spice of life, okay, and uh, are produced from plants. Uh, obviously plants produce them for uh, protective reasons for themselves, um, probably also for communication reasons within other plants. Mm -hmm. We are not 100% sure about that, but we know that many terpenes are also used for attracting, for example, insects for pollination. So there are definitely a lot of uses for the plants, but then we realize that also on animals and so humans as well, terpenes have a strong physiological effects. So what we wanted to look at was, first of all, understanding whether it was true or not that these three main, so we interpreted that beta carophyllin, uh, humulin, and myrcin, which are three very, very common uh, terpenes present in majority of cannabis plant, um, had anti-inflammatory properties. First of all, we wanted to confirm that, uh, which we did. And, and then afterwards, we wanted to understand how do they work in real life? Because in real life, these terpenes are never Hello. an essential oil. Yeah. Exactly. So we started to integrate other elements. And one very striking and interesting data I wanted to share, that for example, we knew that in the, in the common recreational culture, uh, indica plants are defined as plants that have a high mercen uh, quantity. Usually more than 0 0.5 mercen is... Mm, um, considered uh, like an indica plant, which is more sleep inducing and so on. So um, we were wondering, okay, so this cooperation that Myrcen has with THC, does it have it as well with CBD? So does it improve its anti-inflammatory and nociceptive uh, properties? Then uh, exactly. Then uh, and uh, and the interesting part was that we confirmed that both on a cellular level and then on a behavioral level. So on a cellular level, for example, you see that if you try in the what we usually use as a marker to understand whether a receptor is is giving a signal or not, mm -hmm. is measuring levels of calcium. So by measuring the levels of internal calcium, we were seeing that we were using CBD, we would get a spike, and so we knew CBD was doing something. Um, we would use myrcin and we would have a smaller spike, and we knew it was doing something. But what happens when we have both of them together? The spike was like five times higher than the sum of the two. So really what Ethan wow. Russo said it's on... Like yeah, it's like way more than the sum of the two, which is true, and this is this is exactly the beautiful thing about the entourage effect. Yeah. So what do you think about the, the main issues now for the patients using medical cannabis in Italy? The two main issues are this one. First of all, that there is a huge lack of education, especially on the medical sector, and then everything that goes around that, so pharmacists, biologists, biochemists, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the main issue, I think, widespread around the world, is that medical doctors and also scientists don't even know that there is an endocannabinoid yeah, system. It's unbelievable, right? Yeah. On the other side, if there is no medical cannabis enough in the pharmacies, either people avoid taking the medicine and don't end up not having, like they have a prescribed medicine that they don't manage to get and mm -hmm. after 30 days the prescription expires. So 
and there is a big cost yeah. you know behind it or otherwise you're letting people basically going down the legal route which is even worse I think for like the responsibility of a EU country that is completely letting down uh, its patients mm -hmm. and if you uh, if you're a patient in Italy how is the access so what do we have to do to obtain the medication okay so basically uh, it's some supposed to be simple you need to find a doctor which could be any doctor mm -hmm. anyone who is a medical doctor could be your prescribing doctor mm -hmm. you can prescribe for any condition that has some science on it ah, okay. but the only one that is going to be reimbursed uh, is at the moment multiple sclerosis pain, uh, pain and uh, epilepsy. epilepsy so these are the three and every cancer patient so if you do it as palliative care for cancer then yes it is reimbursed but again only in some regions so there is 21 regions in italy and i think just half of it reimbursed it the other half doesn't okay. well thank you so much for being here thank you thank you